Undoubtedly, if our households as Muslims today resembled that of Abu Bakr's, our situation individually and collectively would be most different. The Prophet's migration story makes it so clear that every member of Abu Bakr's household was planning for the sake of Islam. Abu Bakr, his wife, his daughters, his sons, even his shepherd were all planning, working, sacrificing, thinking for the religion of Allah during this journey. Each and every generation of Muslims for the past 1400 years owes a debt of gratitude to the family of Abu Bakr. Now think about it. If it wasn't for his wife, Umm Ruman, being patient with the extended absence of her husband and also covering the secrets relating to her husband's disappearance from Mecca, what would have become of the Prophet's migration, alayhi salatu wasalam? Take, for example, Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, who secretly delivered food to them whilst they hid in the cave. What would they have eaten had she not done so at great risk to herself? Take Abdullah. Abu Bakr's son, who mingled with the pagans by day, listened to their news, plots, before then embarking on a stealthy return to the cave by night to update the Prophet ﷺ of all of their plans. Even Abu Bakr's shepherd played a part in driving his flock of sheep close to the cave to deliver milk to the Prophet ﷺ and his companion. And he would also direct his sheep to tread over the footsteps of Abdullah who delivered news to them by night to eliminate any trace to the cave. We owe the family of Abu Bakr so much for their service and their sacrifice, each member being a testament to the nurturing provided by Abu Bakr and Umm Ruman, his wife. This team effort is a goal we should all have in life. To produce a family unit which shares a common goal of glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, preparing for the hereafter, furthering the cause of Islam, so ask yourself the question, how can I make my household resemble that of Abu Bakr's? How was Abu Bakr able to unify his family to work for a single cause? What talents do the individuals within my family possess? How can these talents then be nurtured, fostered, invested in the cause of Islam? Carry your household on your shoulders. Feel responsible, lead by example, and let them see in you what you hope to see in them. Fast forwarding to the Treaty of Al Hudaybiyah, which is the name of a pivotal agreement made between the Muslims and the pagans. This treaty was truly a faith testing experience for the companions of the Prophet Muhammad because he agreed to conditions that were at first seen to be extremely disadvantageous to the Muslims. Now, prior to the signing of the treaty, the Prophet ﷺ saw a dream in which he had entered Mecca and he had circumambulated around the Kaaba as a pilgrim. The companions were so happy when they heard this news because they revered Mecca. They'd been exiled from it. It's their home. It's been a long time and they deeply missed the Kaaba. So they heard this news, the dream, which is revelation from Allah. And the Muslims got dressed as pilgrims. They bought sacrificial animals with them and they embarked on a journey from Medina all the way to Mecca, eagerly hoping to visit their beloved city of Mecca. Even if it's just for a brief moment. And it was clear that the sole intention of this journey was none other than to perform Umrah, the minor pilgrimage. However, to their surprise, upon reaching an area called Al Hudaybiyah, they were barred from entering Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ then negotiated with the Meccan ambassadors until they agreed to sign a peace treaty, some of the clauses of which stated the following. Number one, the Muslims shall return to Medina on this occasion and come back for Umrah next year. And when they do, they shall not stay in Mecca for more than three days. Number one, Clause number two, war activities shall be suspended for 10 years, during which time uh, both parties will live in full security and they will not raise the sword against one another. Clause number three, if anyone from the Quraysh goes over to the Muslims without his guardian's permission, he shall be sent back to the people of Quraysh. But should any of Prophet Muhammad wasallam's followers return to the Quraysh, he shall not be sent back. That is so unfair. 
Yet the Prophet ﷺ in his wisdom signed the agreement. At this news, Umar's fury overcame him because he saw the Muslims with a stronger negotiating position and he was appalled that the pagans had dictated such conditions which served no purpose other than just a desire to be arrogant and difficult. So Umar in his sincerity rushed to the Messenger وسلم, and he said, are you not truly the Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet said to him, I am. And Umar said to him, are we not upon the truth and our enemies upon falsehood? He said, that is correct. Umar said, so why should we accept so lowly conditions? The Prophet وسلم, responded, Inni Rasulullah walastu asihi wa huwa nasiri. I am the Messenger of Allah. I will not disobey him and he will give me victory. Memorize those words and you will find out for a moment why that is. Umar, he then asked the question, but did you not tell us that we're going to go to Mecca and circumambulate around the Kaaba? The Prophet said to him, did I uh, tell you that you're going to do that this year? Umar, he said, no. And the Prophet وسلم, said, then you shall enter Mecca. I promise you that. And you shall circumambulate around the Kaaba. And Umar was silenced. But then he, he remained frustrated at the terms that seemed to favor the idolaters. So he rushed to Abu Bakr, hoping that he would convince the Prophet وسلم, to reconsider the clauses, the clauses of this treaty. So Umar, he said to Abu Bakr, Oh Abu Bakr, is he not truly the messenger of Allah? And Abu Bakr, he said, he is. Umar said, are we not upon the truth and our enemies are upon falsehood? Abu Bakr said, that is correct. Umar, he said, so why are we accepting such lowly conditions? Listen to the response of Abu Bakr. Subhanallah. And they will sound familiar. He said, Ayyuhar rajul, innahu la rasulullah. وَلَيْسَ يَعْصِي رَبَّهُ وَهُوَ نَاصِرُهُ فَاسْتَمْسِكْ بِغَرْزِهِ فَوَاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ عَلَى الْحَقِّ He said, O oh man, he is indeed the messenger of Allah and he will not disobey his Lord and he will give him victory. So we'll hold on to his way because I swear by Allah that he is upon the truth. Omar, he said, but did he not tell us that we were going to go to Mecca and circumambulate around the Kaaba? And Abu Bakr responded by saying he did, but did he say that we were going to do that this year? Omar said no. Abu Bakr, he said, then you shall enter Mecca. I promise you that. And you shall circumambulate around the Kaaba. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. It's almost as if the very heartbeat of Abu Bakr pounded according to the rhythm of the pounding of the heart of Prophet Muhammad It's as if his soul had synchronized with that of the Messenger Abu Bakr, as you just heard, repeated the exact same words of the Prophet Muhammad to Umar without any indication that he had heard the Prophet وسلم, speak with Umar. What you and I can take from this is the importance of trusting Allah Almighty like Abu Bakr did. For example, even if you fail to understand the reasons underlying certain obligations and prohibitions of Islam, have full confidence in your Creator and Maker and don't challenge His knowledge by picking and choosing from His commandments and His prohibitions. Be completely aware that Allah desires for you the happiness that you desire for yourself more than you desire it for yourself. Trust Him. After all, He is the worthiest of your trust. Whenever you feel hesitant, Whenever you feel uninspired to practice your religion, pushed to argue with a sincere advisor or pressured by a societal norm to compromise on your belief, or if you find yourself plunging into despair because of the battered nature of the Muslims that you see worldwide, or whatever else it may be during moments of spiritual weakness or doubt, remember the confident words of Abu Bakr when he said to Umar, O oh man, he is indeed the messenger of Allah. and He will not disobey his Lord and he will give him victory. So hold on to his way for I swear by Allah he is upon the truth. When it comes to Islamic knowledge, Abu Bakr's grasp was unmatched. And this was attested to by the other companions. The Messenger وسلم, once surprised his companions with the following statement during a sermon that he was delivering. 
And he said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَيَّرَ عَبْدًا بَيْنَ الدُّنْيَا وَبَيْنَ مَا عِنْدَهُ فَاخْتَارَ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ He said, Allah Almighty has given a slave of his the choice between this world and what is with him. And that man, that slave, chose that which is with Allah. So the apparent meaning of the statement is what most likely comes to mind when you hear it or read it. A man was given a choice between this world and the hereafter. End of story. Abu Bakr, however, viewed the statement in a different light altogether. It was only after moments that these words touched his ears that he broke down into heavy cry. Imagine. Then he stood up amidst all of the crowds and he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, we sacrifice our mothers and fathers for you. We sacrifice our mothers and fathers for you. As he wept. The narrator of this moving incident, Abu Sa'id, he said, What makes this Shaykh cry? Allah has simply given a slave the choice between this world and what is with him. And he chose what is with him. Soon after. He and the rest of the companions realized the reason why Abu Bakr was crying and why he said those words. He said, فَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ هُوَ الْمُخَيَّرْ وَكَانَ أَبُو بَكْرٍ هُوَ أَعْلَمَنَا بِهِ He said, it became apparent to us that the one who was given this choice was the messenger of Allah himself. And Abu Bakr, Abu Sa'id says, Abu Bakr was indeed the most knowledgeable of us with respect to the Prophet It was a subtle indication by the Prophet to his Ummah that he didn't have much longer left with them, that his time was almost up and his blessed soul was due to return back to its creator. And so the Prophet وسلم, turned to Abu Bakr, who was in this state his heart had broken. He was crying, saying, We sacrifice our parents for you. And he said to Abu Bakr, Ya Abu Bakr, la tabki. Oh, Abu Bakr, do not cry. And then he said, Inna nasi fi wa malihi Abu Bakr. There isn't anyone whom I am more indebted to with regards to his companionship and his wealth than Abu Bakr. And if I, the Prophet of Allah, were to take a khalil, meaning a friend of the highest order. If I was to take a khalil from my ummah, I would have taken Abu Bakr. But the brotherhood and the love of Islam is sufficient. He then issued precise instructions, making it even more manifest to the companions. The high regard he held Abu Bakr in. And he said, لا يبقين في المسجد باب إلا سد إلا باب أبي بكر. He said, close off. Every door that leads to the mosque, with the exception to the door of Abu Bakr, keep that open. Some companions had built their homes around the mosque, and so they enjoyed direct access into the masjid. But with these instructions, all of the other doors were sealed off, with the exception to the door of Abu Bakr. 